Hello, my name is Guillermo Gallego, and in this video we will go over some of the methods of event processing. It will look a bit uh, generic at this point in the course because we, we are trying to stay uh, at a high level and we haven't gone into the details of different algorithms, so that this will hopefully become more clear as we progress through the course. Okay, so it starts with the question, how do we process events? We have seen in previous videos what are events, what events are, and what are the, the different representations that we use them, we use to convert them. Um, now, then why are those representations, right? And we kind of talk about it in the previous video, and there could be constraints enforced by the method or by the platform. Um, so a very relevant question, at least from a signal processing point of view, from an algorithm designer point of view, is how to process the events. We have this raw data, how can we extract information from, from it to solve a specific task? Well, this is kind of the, the big picture. Uh, we have uh, events that are coming from, from a camera. These are raw events, and we want the desired output, right? Uh, that's kind of the input output and in the middle we have an algorithm and hardware like a platform a robot that um, would implement um, some sort of some sort of intelligence uh, maybe guided by additional knowledge to be able to process the the input events and produce um, an estimated quantity this is the overall picture imagine now that we have a um, I don't know, slam algorithm. We want to do uh, the camera pose estimation uh, and, 3D, and build a 3D map of the scene. That's the desired output. And we want to do this with an event camera. Then, well, if we want that desired output, then it means that, for example, we, we want to have a build a slam uh, algorithm on, um, on a CPU and wanted to make it to run on a CPU. Well, if we have this output and this is uh, the goal is to build this algorithm then the question for example would be how to process events how many events should we process how can we achieve the goal of getting camera posts from events right because an event an event alone maybe doesn't give enough information to produce a camera pose or to produce a 3d map of the scene so how many events should we consider and uh, how should we process them and it gives the question that it's kind of guiding the design algorithm how to process them what internal state and event representation do we need? And these, they feed back on each other. They are constantly talking. So during algorithm design, um, you are constantly iterating in this whole pipeline, but more between the events and the, the algorithm implementation mm -hmm. to produce the desired output that you want. Um, so we previously take a look at some event representations and in this video we're taking a look at uh, how to process the events just to give like an, an overview of it okay so to answer the question how many events should we use we know that events come asynchronously continuously in time and they are somehow sparse and uh, the question of how many events should we use it would be because every event doesn't have doesn't carry too much information, right? Uh, it's equivalent more or less, so can, how can we estimate the unknown parameters? How many events do we need and how do we need to process those events? In the picture here on the top, we see, for example, artificial frames created uh, by accumulating events over some interval of time, like from 0.1 milliseconds, where you could see individual events uh, to 33 milliseconds, where there is kind of a blur and caused by the considering many events and projecting them or accumulating them only on, on a 2D frame. And somewhere in the middle, maybe if we want to do camera pose estimation, we would consider a, a representation somewhere in the middle that has all edges, right? Of, if you want to, for example, localize with respect to this square. And there are two philosophies here. One is um, how many events should be used? Well, a philosophy or one family of approaches it says that uh, we try to use event by event processing so one event at a time and another one is that we we consider uh, event packets uh, so we process the last n events together at once so event by events is on the right most of the image and a packet of event would be I don't know, the rest maybe more towards the left 
and each uh, family of approaches has advantages and disadvantages, right? So what's, what are the advantages of considering processing one event at a time? Well, mostly latency, that because sensors have a very low latency, if you process one event at a time, time in principle, you are obtaining minimum latency and you could get down to microseconds. Um, whereas this is not the case of um, event packet processing because you need to wait uh, for the last n events and uh, to to arrive to start processing. Although this n it's a tunable parameter that you can uh, you can select depending on your needs. What are the disadvantages of each method or each uh, approach? So event by event processing with uh, if you have high speed motion, then you have millions of events per second, and this can be a huge burden on the on event processing. If you want to uh, produce an update of the state for every event that comes, it could be super expensive, and maybe you need uh, dedicated hardware or accelerated, just like graphics processing units. And this may not be the case with if you process a packet of events, uh, but uh, the disadvantages is are well. Yes, you are introducing some latency, so you no longer have microsecond resolution, although it may not be needed. So kind of the pros and cons of each uh, approach are uh, almost complementary. In these two examples, um, we are now taking a look at the two SLAM algorithms who are trying to do uh, estimation of the uh, pose of the camera an estimation of a 3D map. And on the left, we see an approach that uh, works on packets of events. Uh, and on the right, we see an approach that process uh, events one at a time. So the one on the left works on, uh, on a CPU and the one on the right works in, on a GPU, both in real time. These are two uh, viable options, right? It depends on what are the the constraints on the hardware platform, uh, the constraints on the on the method design. Um, we are still in the in an exploratory phase in event-based vision where we are trying to come up with new ways to process the events. So let's give a, a short overview of methods of event processing, and this might look a bit uh, generic at this point in the course because we haven't really taking a look at the uh, detail methods. So let's go ahead and have this uh, high level uh, overview. So we've seen there are event by event methods and in this category we may consider filters either deterministic or probabilistic such as the Bayes filter and uh, artificial neural networks such as uh, spiking neural networks. In the group, uh, in the category of uh, processing events by groups or by packets of events. Then we have, uh, in general, optimization of variational methods. We have handcrafted feature extractors um, plus shallow uh, networks. Or then we also have modern deep neural networks on grid race representation of events. That's why we have seen previously different event representations. Uh, so if we take a look at the first category, uh, processing event by event, well, this means that we are processing event, one event at a time. How much information does an event carry? Well, not much, right? Because we know that it, every event has the X, Y, so the pixel coordinate and the timestamp of the event and the polarity. And this is typically not sufficient to estimate, uh, for example, the full uh, camera pose, six degrees of freedom, or to estimate uh, part of a, of a depth map of the scene, right? Well, this is clearly not enough. So then the vision algorithm needs to have some additional knowledge, either from external information, such as uh, a map of the world is provided uh, so that the camera is able to localize, or it could be built from past events. And for example, the map, right? If you consider a SLAM algorithm, then past events were already used to build um, a map of the scene that now can be used to uh, localize the camera as a new event arrives. So this additional knowledge needs to be fused, to needs to be assimilated with each incoming event to produce an output. 
What are the advantages? We've mentioned them. Minimum latency, that's the main advantages. And still, it rem we are preserving natural properties of the sensor, such as the, the synchronous and sparse. We try to process uh, in the same way. The disadvantages are that, uh, well, this could be expensive. If we update the system on a per event basis, uh, depending on what uh, operations are I, uh, used, then this could be too much for real-time processing. What are some of the examples of event-by-event -event methods? Well, background activity filter, for example, for event noise removal, where as an event comes, it checks on the neighboring pixels uh, how far away in time the events happened. And if it's an isolated event, it removes it. So this is a deterministic filter. Another one, it's a per pixel temp uh, temporal filter for image reconstruction. And this we will take a look when we get to the topic of image reconstruction. And we have probabilistic filters, such as a parallel tracking and mapping using the base filter, using extended Kalman filters or particle filters. And there are examples of this in the literature, many of those. Uh, actually, that's more or less how event-by-event -event methods uh, were popularized, right, uh, in the context of SLAM and camera localization. And here are some references from uh, 2013, 14, and uh, 2018. Um, also, uh, examples of uh, methods for event use for event by event processing are multi-layer artificial neural networks, whether spiking or not, and they can they are used for object classification. They could be implemented in spiking neural networks. So, a key question when we review some of the methods is: uh, What's the additional knowledge uh, on each system? We, we haven't really looked into methods of yet, but we know that an event is not enough. So what's the additional knowledge that is being used? For example, in the case of SLAM, this could be a map, a map of the scene that it's used for uh, localizing the camera. Um, in the case of image reconstruction, then, for example, the additional knowledge is the previous uh, image intensity reconstruction built from past event and that's the state of the system and as a new event arrives then the new event is fused with uh, the current uh, system state to produce an update uh, and the second one is uh, what's the inference mechanism used by each method to process the event and uh, output the state update so this data fusion how, how is the data fusion uh, realized uh, it could be done with extended Kalman filters, for example, by means of uh, an innovation signal or by any other um, inference mechanism. And that's these are basically the questions that differentiate one method from another, the, besides the task at hand. Okay, in the second group, uh, second category, we have uh, methods that work on packets of events, and these process events in in packets, also called groups, also called a window, like a window of events, space-time neighborhood. There are many names for this, and they aggregate information from multiple events, uh, so they may not need additional knowledge. Um, events are processed differently depending on their representation, and we have seen many representations already. And so there are specific methods uh, for time surfaces, uh, for event frames, for voxel grids, and they are typically, they do not operate the same. They are not the same operations that you would use on time surfaces as those that you would use for voxel grids, although it could be. Mm, you know, convolutions are used everywhere, right? So you could use convolutions for time surfaces or for voxel grids. What are the advantages? Well, um, then we rely on the method itself to do efficient event aggregation. Uh, they still may, may be uh, synchron asynchronous if we accumulate a fixed number of events. So this could be like an adaptive rate. They don't need to necessarily, because we are working on packets of events, we, need, we don't need to process them in a synchronous way. right? We could still select uh, a varying number of events or a fixed number of events or a varying set uh, time slice and produce an asynchronous output. So that the, we know that the event cameras have a variable rate, so they produce uh, events, uh, more or less event depending on the scene dynamics. 
and in the same way our algorithm could produce uh, or update the state of produce and output uh, with a variable rate. Another advantage is that the, the toolbox that we have uh, for processing uh, groups of events is typically larger than and the set of tools uh, that we can use for event by events. We have many more things that we can do when we have multiple events than when we have a single event. And the disadvantages, as we have mentioned, is that uh, you need to wait for some events, and so in it introduces some latency, but it may not be critical in, in some cases, right? What are some of the examples of methods working on packets of events? Well, we have um, conventional computer vision algorithms on event frames or voxel grids, uh, such as the one here. For example, we have converted the events uh, to some uh, frame representation. This is from eBflowNet RSS 2018, so four frames actually, and they pass through a modern unit-like uh, neural network. So we have converted events waiting with some latency, and after that we use conventional computer vision methods. This could be, as we said, modern artificial neural networks, like the example on the image, encoder decoder architectures, or it could be classical feature detection, extraction, and tracking methods, such as um, some Harris corner detector or KLT tracking. It Sometimes it works decently. Other examples were hierarchical feature structures uh, followed by shallow classifiers, such as in the example for time surfaces, um, the classical HOTS paper from PAMI. Um, there are also contrast or focus maximization methods on motion compensated images. So as we have seen, we see the, the, the type of methods they change depending on the representation, right? So for event frames, for time surfaces, or for motion compensated images. And a key question is, um, how is information in the event stream aggregated and filtered to produce a state update? That is to produce the desired output. And that's what differentiates uh, methods from one another, also on top of the different type of representation that is being used. And again, this is something that is not clear at this point because we haven't really looked in detail into any method of event-based processing, but these are questions to keep in mind to try to see what are the difference between different methods and, um, and try to understand them better. Um, another key question is how is additional knowledge, if any, considered? It's, is it... Uh, also like a combination of built from past events or it's only considered the knowledge and there is no additional knowledge because all the knowledge is given by the by the events in the in the group or in the packet or is it some form of uh, prior and uh, on the type of motion that we expect for example that that's kind of some, some possible answers Okay, and so for reading in for this part, we are mostly uh, recommending section three of the survey paper. Uh, thank you very much.